Hello guys, it's Adina and we are actually on break from the Atheist and Recovery podcast, but I thought it would be fun to share some of my most popular episodes as well as my favorite episodes from year one. For me, listening to some of these old episodes, I always pick up something new and learn something in addition to what I thought I already learned uh, from the guests. And if it's a book review, I love going through a book and reviewing the pages upon pages of highlights and sussing out my favorite ideas that I feel are worth sharing. So before you go, don't forget to sign up for the weekly newsletter where we talk about learning to identify patterns of dysfunctional thinking, changing the dysfunctional thinking into something more positive, And I throw in a little homework for good measure, and you can find the link to sign up for the newsletter in the show notes. Okay, guys, I hope you enjoy this Encore episode. Welcome to the Atheist in Recovery podcast, where we talk about finding hope in recovery. And now your host, Dr. Adina Silvestri. Hello, Atheists in Recovery land and... Welcome to episode 21 of the Atheists in Recovery podcast. And today I am excited to introduce you to Dr. Tarman. Dr. Tarman and I talk all about food and sugar addiction. And I think that you'll find Dr. Tarman's early spiritual background very interesting in that she was in a convent for a few years in Germany, and she talks about how that impacted her sense of self, but she also talks about her journey through addiction and how she would rely on her early spiritual upbringing to to help her with connection and a belief in, in something, whatever that thing was at the time. And how she found that that was just incredibly important for her and for the people that she that she serves. And then we also, we talk about many things, but we definitely talk about the neurobiology of addiction, which is always my favorite part. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, she just, um, she's a wealth of knowledge. And I hope that you, I hope that you glean some insight from this. Okay, on to my guest, Dr. Vera Tarman. She is a medical addictions physician in Toronto. She's an author and speaker and works with people who want to break their dependence on unhealthy foods. Over the last 20 years, she has been the medical director at a clinic that has served more than 10,000 patients, including 1,000 with food addictions. She is the author of Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addictions, and its second edition. Her audiences have included more than 50,000 healthcare experts, medical professionals, and others who learn how to break their food addiction through community and peer support. As a recovering food addict, she has maintained a 100-pound weight loss for more than 12 years and has been clean from sugar and flour for eight years. You can join Dr. Tarman's closed Facebook group, Sugar Free for Life support group, I'm Sweet Enough, and grab her free cheat sheet, Nine Sneaky Ways to Quit Sugar, Stop Cravings, and Prevent Withdrawal at her website, addictionsunplugged.com. Okay, here we go. Dr. Vera Tarman, welcome to the show. Hello. So I want to start our conversation by inquiring about your spiritual background from childhood. Just uh, give us a little background there. Okay. Well, my background is a little bit complex. I uh, grew up, my first three years of my life, I actually grew up in a convent because I um, I was born in Germany. And um, I was born in 1957. And in those days, uh, there wasn't a welfare system in the way that there is now. It was basically the churches that did the um, various types of uh, work, like In this case, I lived in a convent that was for mothers and children. So I lived there for the first three years of my life, and then I came to Canada as a three-year-old. And uh, I have no recollection of that time period, but I know that it was heavily saturated by uh, convents, like Catholic Church mythology and stories and all that sort of stuff. And then after that, went to uh, Catholic schools, because that's what Catholics did in those days. Mm -hmm. Um, And even until I was 17 years old, had in my background, I'm going to be a nun one day. And I think somewhere in my teens, I just 
thought, no, what am I thinking? It was, <laughs> it was like this thing in the background that finally popped up as, that's just ridiculous, that's absurd, I, I have no interest in doing that. But because of that, it was always in the background as an understanding about, I guess, the church. And a lot of people in my generation will talk about how um, they hate the church, they hate dogma, they hate uh, priests. I mean, there's so much bad press about that stuff now. Mm. And I certainly remember getting strapped and, and, you know, disciplined by nuns. They were pretty unpleasant um, people sometimes. Uh, but I have a soft spot in my heart, nevertheless, because I must have met some that were very nice to me. So I don't have a sense of uh, church is bad. But I do have a sense of I don't believe in church. I don't believe in I, I believe in the idea of myth and, and, and symbols and rituals, but not actually that it's, uh, there's a God behind it. I don't have a knee-jerk negative reaction that a lot of people do, but, but I'm also define myself as an agnostic. And I think that in my teens and childhood, I was always asking questions like, how is it possible that, uh, you know, we eat this God, Jesus, and, and, you know, he's supposed to be our God. Like I asked those kind of, and never got good answers. So I always had a developed a sense of, I don't really believe this stuff, but I nevertheless saw the power of, uh, it, both good and bad. So my relationship now from then, and you know, it's continued on. Oh, yeah. When, when I uh, was a teenager, I finally decided I'm not going to be a nun. Uh, but I was very attracted to then I grew up in the uh, 70s and 80s when everyone was going to India and they were going to, you know, meet a guru and go to mm. ashrams and, and all that sort of thing. And so I went to India in search for a guru and met some gurus. For, wow. for those who are um, aware of, uh, you know, who was around in those days, there was a guy named uh, Sri Rajneesh. He was the guy who later became known as Osho. And if you do any kind of um, higher power spiritual readings now, you'll find a lot of stuff on Osho still to this day, even though he's long since died. But I went there to the ashrams that were there in India. And again, I had that sense of there's something very powerful about this concept of mm. human nature seeming to need group connection and a belief in something. But the actual people that we believe, I found very hard to buy into. Like the guy, Rajneesh, he had like 99 Rolls Royces. I don't wow. know if you heard of him, but he was the guy with the 99 Rolls Royces. And then you know, later we heard of other people like Jim Jones and all those guys who, who started off with this amazing pull, but then ended up themselves being... Like, not gods by any means. No, the opposite of, it sounds like. Yeah, exactly. So I was always very interested in um, human nature and my nature of, of being drawn to this, but not actually, never really finding something there. But so it was always like there's the search, but the answers are never um, are never worthy of the search. So now I see it as human nature is we are built to be seekers. I see myself yeah. as a seeker that has not found something. And I don't think I'm meant to find something. I think I'm always meant to ask the question. Yeah. So that's where I see my spirituality today as somebody who's open to further questioning. Yeah. I love that. I love how you describe yourself as a seeker. And, and I think a lot of people, um, agnostics and um, not me, I don't know about atheists because atheists have decided that there is nothing, but the people in between that haven't gotten that far are really seekers. And uh, I remember reading, uh, finding the whole literature uh, about uh, agnosticism as being more faith-driven than the faith stuff, because the faith stuff was like, here's the answer. There were no more questions, like, here's the answer. Uh, so I found that just very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No, 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 no. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And I see that too in, in my work, even the people will self identify as an atheist, they will go to church. Yeah. And they'll pray, especially, at, you know, in times of, of just complete and, and utter despair. And yeah. the, some of that early childhood stuff doesn't actually leave. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I think I think because I I'm assuming that at some point we're going to talk about twelve step stuff. I don't know, but um, yes, we are. Yeah, but one of the things that I see that's similar to what I'm talking about and twelve step is that that one of the fundamental principles of twelve step is surrender. Yeah, but it, it doesn't matter who you surrender to, a higher higher power of your own understanding. But it's that concept of surrender, which is like the concept of seeking. Who cares what we're actually finding? It's the seeking and the surrendering that I think is the magic of of recovery and of, of uh, good life. Yeah. yeah. I want to talk a little bit about um, 
about your book, which yeah. is the reason that you're that you're here today. And something that I found so interesting was the very beginning of the book. You say that you and and um, your co-author, you're both food oh, addicts, yeah. and uh, and you struggle to control your addiction through diet pills, diet doctors, and even diet candy. And I thought, wow, yeah. this. This is something that so many of us are struggling with. So I wonder if you yeah. could take us on that on that recovery journey. Well, uh, it, it was um, that was with Phil Riddell, and he's um, uh, a, a person that uh, has done a lot of. He's like a pioneer in, in America in the U.S. Hmm. with food addiction. Like he's been writing since the '70s and '80s. There's a few people who have been speaking. Um, to uh, I mean, they're kind of lost now because. They spoke then, and we're getting more um, heard now. But as they're kind of um, um, not re retiring, but you know, I guess retiring. Um, <laughs> but he, he, um, he, and uh, his story and mine too were, um, y you know, solely uh, trying to figure out how to manage this addiction to food, um, and oftentimes a previous addiction or a co-addiction, I mean, just addiction itself, yeah. but um, food being um, one that is just so powerful and yet so unrecognized, like so dis easily dismissed. And um, there, there are so many solutions that he found, like diet pills, diet clubs, diet gurus, diet books, like so many ways to um, capture a solution that looks like it's going to work and that it doesn't work. And uh, he had that experience and I had that experience. And then we both came to a common solution, which was, oh my God, this is an addiction. It's mm -hmm. not a diet. It's not just being overweight. It's not just pigging out all the time and not being able to control ourselves. We're dealing with an addiction. And um, both of us coming from different backgrounds, but an addiction background going, well, hey, if it's an addiction, let's use the tools of addiction like 12 step and, and uh, the slogans and yeah. all the stuff that comes with recovery in addiction that doesn't come from the diet world or the obesity world. And let's use those tools, which seems like an obvious thing to do, but to try to sell that to other clinicians uh, was the reason for uh, the book and for us teaming up then also to try to sell it to people who are not, I mean, like, I'm guessing the fact that you and I are talking, you must have felt intuitively that this was your story too, or something about it rang true for you. Well, so many of the people that I, that I work with, uh, so I have a private practice in Richmond and, and I work with individuals that are struggling with substance abuse. Yes. But I also find that the food is something that they pick up once they yes. lay the, the substance down. Yes, exactly. So people who, who have already dealt with that, that struggle know what I'm talking about. But uh, in the larger population uh, where people, uh, you know, they, they see that struggle, addiction as something stigmatic and it's not them, it's the, it's the crack addict, it's the alcoholic, it's the, it's the smoker. Um, they don't see themselves as being that same thing, having that same phenomena. Um, so the book was also to, to kind of break that boundary or not boundary, that barrier to say, yeah. hey, it's you too. It's not just them on the street with the bags and they're, you know, huffing in the corner somewhere. If that's you. What they're doing is the same thing you're doing when, you know, open up the fridge late at night and go, what do I want? And, you know, an hour later you're stuffed and you feel sick. Mm. It's not any different. So the book was a way to um, uh, break that barrier and make food um, as pertinent a, a discussion. Like, like, don't dismiss this this thing as uh, being silly. It's it's a real thing. In the same way as trying to quit smoking. The same way as trying to quit drugs. Yeah. Yeah. And why do you think that people are so resistant to this idea of food being an addiction? <laughs> well, because because um, I, I I think I guess it's, I guess what I'm trying to say is that. That the people that you work with, that I work with, um, who are already addicted, don't have a problem with that. Right, I think that right. many they're relieved. But the other people, it's like I'm not an addict. Like it's, it's stigmatic. You don't want to take on this this thing that I'm the same as this person who's uh, on the street. You know, um, no, I'm not. 
yes, you are. So I think there's a sense of stigma, especially if the person's already dealing with obesity. They've got the stigma of being overweight. You're going to add um, the stigma of addiction on top of that. People don't like that. It's just, it's like yet another burden to carry. And then the other thing is, is if, if I say, if I say, um, um, if I convince somebody that they're addicted to something, the implication then is, is that if you want to get better, you're going to have to stop doing it. And, uh, you know, no sugar addict is willingly going to stop their uh, favorite bread and their favorite uh, dessert at night. Dessert, and, yeah. Yeah, all that. That, that means you got to stop all that. And it's like people go, what? Are you kidding? No way. Okay, let, a little bit. I'll cut down. But it, you know, I'm sure you know in your work that there are some people who cannot cut down. It just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. No, oh, it just doesn't work. And, you know, we live in a world of moderation and, and harm reduction, and it's all about, you know, you don't have to, you know, we don't want to scare the person away. Um, uh, so it, it just becomes very muddy on all fronts, you know? Mm. Yeah. So that's what the book is. It's a, it's a way to give some validation to this perspective. And even to this day in 19, uh, where are we now? 2019. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 2019. Right. Even to this day, when I uh, went to the publisher, I mean, they were happy to do a second edition. But when I said, okay, now we got to get some promotion here, you know, get me on the radio uh, so I can talk about it in Canada. In Canada, that would be CBC. And CBC is like Canadian. It's a great venue. And they said, no, 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 they, they're not interested. It's, it's, it's a niche topic. It's a topic people don't want to talk about. So even now, that's still today, like this year, uh, we're still battling this view. Wow. Of, uh, you know, how can the, how can sugar be addictive? It's frustrating. <laughs> it is. It is frustrating. But I think that you're right when, when you, know, you talk to people who are struggling and, and they don't understand why moderation isn't working for them. And you bring up this idea of addiction. It's it's like, a you know, it's like, oh, my God, there's there's hope. Now I know. Yes. What to do next. Yeah. Yes, but you don't, you don't. You won't get there. That person doesn't get there until they've accepted that. Oh, this could actually be an addiction. You know, it sounds like there's. You've got to jump that hurdle, and it, it's a hard hurdle to jump. It is a hard hurdle to jump. Yeah. So, what are some things that you that you can share that helped you sort of jumping that that hurdle? In in my case, and in Phil's case, so like we said, we tried the diet books. We tried yeah. the, the you know, blah, blah, blah. Like when you've reached the end of the line and there just is nothing left, it, it, it's like any, any addiction. You talk about the willingness to surrender. You've got it. I guess we say you hit bottom. You, you, you don't have anything left. I've tried everything that I can do. There, uh, people say the gift of desperation. There's a version of God, gift of desperation. <laughs> you know, you have to have a level of desperation that you're willing to try this horrendous idea of abstinence. Yeah. And I am an addict. And until, you know, if there's any room to maneuver to say, maybe I can still control this, a person's going to go there. It's kind of like they got to reach that point. And that's what happened to me. You know, when I turned 50, I, I had reached the point where um, I was just so, I mean, people say morally bankrupt, just, just exhausted from every attempt that I possibly could, that I was willing to say, okay, I'll try this. And like, oh my God, it was so easy once I did that. And I don't know what that's, that's actually the, um, the spiritual moment is when, mm. when you let go of trying to do it yourself and let it, let it go to another. I mean, you know, when I teach in class, I, I, uh, you know, I say with step two, step two traditionally being, I came to believe in a higher power, uh, which a lot of people don't like that concept. I always say, then forget the higher power. Just came to believe in another perspective than your own. You know, you are not the only one making the uh, rules here and your rules aren't working. There are other rules. Try those. That's step two, as far as I'm concerned. You know? Yeah, I, I agree. I, in my work as well, I, I bring in the spiritual connection, a higher power, Yeah, someone living or dead. It could be your dead grandmother, <laughs> you know, that yeah. the person that always had your best interests in mind. Well, what would she say to you at this point? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So I want to, I think that maybe talking a little bit about the neurochemistry of addiction mm -hmm. would be helpful. And then I want to jump to AA. <laughs> so, okay, sure. Yeah. Well, the, neuro, the neurochemistry is, uh, you know, you were saying a little bit earlier, people are really relieved to hear that there is something other than just their own poor willpower. In the book, I describe this, I think, quite well in a couple of chapters. Mm -hmm. And often in my teaching will we'll show that this whole tension, this whole torturous struggle between trying to stop, I want to stop, and I can't stop, that there's actually a neurological 
explanation for this whole thing. It's not just you being mentally uh, weird. You know, it's, yeah. it, there's an explanation for this. And the explanation is that the impulsive need to feel better or to feel good or to not feel bad if you're feeling uncomfortable is hooked to what we call the limbic system, which is essentially our emotional center, which is kissing cousins to our instinctual responses. I do things that I like because they save my life. And um, I don't like things and I'm afraid of things that are dangerous to me. Like it's, that's how we're wired. You know, nobody wants to uh, do something that's dangerous because it's dangerous. I mean, you may get a thrill from it, but ultimately you're cautious. Like, I mean, we're built to be afraid of, to not want things that are fearful and to want things that are helpful. Yeah. And addiction is um, a manipulation of that so that good things become too good to the point of danger, but my this part of my brain doesn't get that danger piece. It just gets the, this is really good. Mm -hmm. And that is the neurochemistry. The thing that makes us want to do things is dopamine. That's our motivator. It's the reason why I want to, you know, get up and read a book or walk in a beautiful field or talk to people. It's dopamine. And if I take a drug that will enhance dopamine or eat food that will enhance dopamine, it's like going on mega, mega walks and meeting mm -hmm. mega people and it's all that stuff. And, and it's to the point where it's far beyond what my body and brain can manage because it's too much. But this part of my brain can't see that. That's another part of the brain that sees the consequences. Um, and this part, this limbic system, which is part of our non-thinking, almost animalistic part, is always more powerful than the intellectual, rational part, mm. which kicks in later, seconds later, you know. So when you um, are tortured between something, it's parts of the brain fighting against each other, but one is already, uh, I want to just, we, we say hijacked. Um, we do. Yeah, uh, so that it's even more powerful than normal you yeah. know so if you put a gun in my face I'm going to be afraid even if you say don't worry I'm not going to shoot I'm right. still afraid and addiction is just making that gun is really big it's like super big and so my ability to even hope to say anything else is, is trampled on uh, so we're, we're mm -hmm. essentially seeing um, it, it's very explainable from, yeah. from a brain biology point of view and, and the whole idea about abstinence is it, it settles some of that hijacking and eventually I don't want to say it erases but it makes the hijacking less and less and less so that uh, you're, you're given back your natural whatever control you have you actually have more control when you're abstinent I mean not if you're used you can't control and use no. you lose the control but your ability to be rational and have make choices good choices is enhanced once you're no longer hijacked. Mm, yeah. And it's all biology. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so are you saying then that when you're abstinent from a food, the longer yeah. that you can stay abstinent, the more your brain is sort of healing in that yeah, part of right. the brain? Yeah, Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I see it. It's the same as a, a diabetes or something. Like if you're a diabetic and you're now eating well and you're taking your meds and you're no longer eating a lot of crap and, you know, your sugar's normalized, you'll even look normal. You know, you won't even feel like you're a diabetic anymore. You'll just live a normal life as long as you don't pick up sugar and stop eating your, doing your meds and all that. And similarly with addiction, like with diabetes, we call it insulin resistance. But you can live with an insulin resistant life by eating good food. Yeah. With addiction, you could almost say it's like a dopamine resistance. <laughs> Something's happened to the dopamine chemistry, neurology, and as long as we live a normal life, not hungry, not angry, not lonely, not tired, you know, halt, and we uh, don't take drugs and we, we live as moderately as we can, not with drugs, but I mean normal life, then uh, you'll look normal. But the mm -hmm. moment you add too much stress, add a drug in, do something, you don't have that ability to bounce back. You're back to being a diabetic. Like immediately, your sugars are wow. off. But your dopamine is off. You know, we say one drink is is um, too much, and a hundred is not enough. Well, one drink will put you off. One cheesecake will put you off. Wow. One super big fight or divorce or or losing your job could put you off. You know, it doesn't even have to be a substance. 
yeah. and just be rude. So that's why a person in addiction, then we're going to talk about AA. Mm -hmm. That's why the recovery program is, the, you know, the first step is stopping the drug. And then you got the whole other 11 steps to make sure that I can stay living a, a life that will uh, make me feel normal. Because mm -hmm. if I have a lot of resentments and, and all sorts of things, I'm not doing the work, as it were, then I'm going to pick up again. That's yeah. what we see. That's what we see. Yeah. Thank you for that. I want to now talk about treatment. <laughs> and so yeah. let's say that you you find out that you are, in fact, addicted to food, you know, sugar, whatever the, the thing is. Uh, yeah. Now what? Uh, well, step one, do you admit that you're powerless over sugar or whatever <laughs> the food is? Because it may be more than sugar. A lot of times depending on the level of addiction that a person is at. It doesn't stop at sugar. It can be flour, which is almost sugar. It breaks yeah. down into sugar pretty quickly. For some people, they can't have even grains. It's too much carbs. Like they have to do a low-carb food plan. And for some people, they even have to, if it's, it's severe enough, because any addiction gets worse over time. Yeah. And if you've let it go for long enough, you may even have to weigh and measure your food because your ability to gauge when you're hungry and what's normal is lost because you've lost it, you know. Mm. Um, so depending on where you are on the line, and that's something that you would do with a counselor or a sponsor or a food coach or a dietitian who knows food addiction. Yeah. Um, then you would figure, okay, that is the level of abstinence I need to have. So you might get away with no sugar, whereas somebody else would have to say, well, I can't have sugar or flour or grains or even dairy. And, you know, Mary over there, she can have dairy, but she can't have, uh, you know, whatever like that. And that's my, that's what I call my abstinence. That's step one. You know, I'm okay. going to call that my abstinence and I'm going to keep to it. And now how do I live life uh, in a world where there is drinking everywhere, smoking everywhere, vaping everywhere, eating candy everywhere. And that's where, uh, uh, you know, the social supports, the peer support, the 12 step groups come in, come into uh, being, you know, you okay. go to an OA meeting or readers anonymous or food addicts anonymous and talk about how, you know, you were at the party last night and they gave you, they wanted to give you all sorts of booze and all sorts of, uh, you know, pumpkin pie or yeah. whatever it is. And how did I say no or tell me what I should do to say no? That's treatment. It's, it's um, relapse prevention. It is. You yeah. got to identify what the trigger is and then how do I protect myself from that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because the, the addiction isn't ever about the substance, right? No. It's about something yeah. much, much more than that. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and when you put down your substance, that's when you see. And food, it's like, it's so easy to pull aside. Like if I'm having a hard day, you know, I don't smoke cigarettes anymore. So I can't pull out a cigarette. I, I don't drink anymore. I can't, I can't have a drink. But you know, I can still have candy, at least in society. That's, that's yeah. easy. But when you don't even have that, most people will say, like people who are in uh, AA or CA will say, um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm clean, uh, but they're still eating a ton of candy. And I want to say, yeah, wait till you stop that candy and then let's talk. Not to say that they're not clean, yeah, yeah. Stuff, but they still don't know what that hole in the donut feels like because they're still filling it with candy. And it's been my experience in, in my work, like I work in a, a treatment center as well, with just generally drugs and alcohol and uh, the people who quit sugar and food are much more emotionally needy than the others why because they have nothing wow. to hide. and the uh, alcoholics and the cocaine users are still chomping on their snickers bar and drinking pop and they still got that little muffer or muffler or whatever it is They're, you know that that's <laughs> muffing them away from the sharp teeth of emotion Whereas we got nothing, it's, you know. <laughs> yeah, time to start seeking, right? Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And now, we, now we're moving into what do you do, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's been my experience. Seeking is enough. You don't have to have an answer. You don't have to have an answer to, you know, what am I seeking? Is it God? It doesn't matter. But my experience is, is that when people, uh, you know, when I sit there and I go, is this guy going to make it? You know, he's coming and he wants yeah. to do everything. And I think, you know, is he going to make it? My hunch is that um, the person who's open to seeking is more likely to make it because that seeking might come in the in the form of um, what work can I do that will help people? Mm. You have to know what it is. The fact that they're asking that question is a, a prognostic. It's a good prognostic indicator of success. Mm. The one that's just sitting there going, I don't know, and 
they're going to go home and watch Netflix tonight. Eventually, they're going to go home and call their old buddies and pick up their drug again. If that's my experience. Mm. I do think that there has to be something other than this, the person, which we call the higher power in AA, but it could be the yeah. higher purpose. Anything. My purpose. It could be writing a book. It could be writing a song. Create. I don't care what it is, but it has to be something <laughs> other than me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the perspective shift is huge. Yes, perspective shift. Okay. If the perspective is just on me, well, you know what? I know what works, food. I know it works, yeah. <laughs> Back to old habits. Yeah, yeah. But food's not going to help you. If I want to help you and I eat, how is that going to help you? It's not. So I have to think of another solution. And uh, it forces me, if I want to help others, it forces me to um, get outside of myself and my own needs. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Thank you so much. I think this is probably a, a good place to end. Do you have any final words of wisdom for us? Uh, well, okay. If there's anybody listening thinking maybe I'm a food addict, I would say, first of all, please get my book, Food yeah. Junkies, um, Recovery from Food Addiction. But I want to say as a message of hope, because I don't know if that's clear in the book, that if you think, okay, maybe I am a food addict, but oh my God, how will I live without my substance tonight, my cheesecake or my I used for me it used to be a tub of ice cream at night and even before that it used to be a bottle of wine like it, it didn't matter it had to be something to get me through the evening into into bed I want to say that it is only a few weeks a couple of weeks of discomfort which you can get through a support group and then it gets easier so it's not like you're gonna live the rest of your life feeling deprived it's only a couple of weeks and then the relief from the obsession will be bigger than the deprivation. So it, it doesn't take that long to feel good. That's the message I want to give. It doesn't take that long to feel good or to feel relieved of the obsession. And I have a, a Facebook group called If Anybody Wants Support to Quit Sugar. That's called um, Sugar Free for Life, I'm Sweet Enough. And uh, please friend me and then uh, become part of the Facebook group. I think that doing a 12-step group is better, but it's a good way to dip your feet in and just hear what people are doing. Yeah. A link to the Facebook group and the book and the show notes. Well, thanks thank so much you. for being on. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Atheists in Recovery podcast. For more great info and to stay up to date, head over to atheistsinrecovery.com.